All right, here we go. It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show with me, Jersey Droz, cartoonist and teaching artist. And with me today are, uh, well, a couple of Michigan artists, although one's not in Michigan right now, uh, and returning to the show. I'll, I'll, I'll do our Skype guest first, Mr. Ryan Estrada of RyanEstrada.com, who is in, you're still in Panama, is that right? Panama, that's right. And uh, you're mostly known for, well, you're working right now on Aki Alliance, uh, revisiting that, doing some new stuff in a new style. Um, cartoon Commune. Mm -hmm. And that, that's pretty much how you make your living, right? Yeah, what, doing custom comics and boring it, stuff like that. <laughs> well, let's, let's give a plug to it because, I mean, you're here after all. Let's, let's, uh, since this is the way you make your living, we should tell people what it is. Uh, well, Cartoon Commune, I just do uh, custom comics and illustrations based on whatever anybody needs a comic about, explaining products or for trade shows, boyfriends of superheroes, stuff like that. And uh, the, the rates are on the, the website, ryanestrada.com, correct? Cool. Yeah. Cartooncommune.com. Oh, cartooncommune.com. Okay. And then uh, you're also revisiting and relaunching Aki Alliance, right? Yeah. Uh, very soon I'll be done with the graphic novel that I've been working on for eight years, and it'll be released as a free ebook and all that good stuff. And... After doing a comic for eight years, I imagine some things have changed in terms of the way it looks, the way it feels, for you at least. Uh, I'm sure there's something that we, that we, the readers, will notice as well, right? Well, I just noticed recently, uh, it, it doesn't really affect it much because each chapter of Aki is a new style. The whole idea is that the character is very indecisive. So she, one, look, one chapter looks like a scrapbook, one chapter looks like it's cut out of a newspaper. Um, so it's always changing, and it's never been hard to do a new style, but the most difficult style for me to match was this week when I had to redo some pages I lost. I had to match my own style from eight years ago, and that was impossible. I'll bet. I'll bet. I couldn't even imagine doing that. Because, I mean, is it, who was it? Was it Neil Adams who said that, like, your style is what you do wrong? And so to go back and try to figure out what you did wrong back then, that must be really hard, actually getting into that mindset again. And then we should also say that, Ryan, you were about to go to, um, is it Columbia you're going to? I'm just going to do a South American road trip. Um, I'm finishing my uh, time in Panama. And I figure while I'm here, i got to knock another continent off and off the list. And so I found a, a $20 boat that will take me to South America. Oh, and my I'm gosh. So, yeah, anybody who wants to hear more about Ryan's exploits across the world can check out, uh, I think it was episode five that you were on, um, Limitations Breed Creativity, where we were talking about your one-month animated feature, and calamity happened with that, and then you, your house got broken into, and a bunch of stuff got stolen, and so uh, it, it, the, the animated feature's been pretty much done, it's just now it's all in post, right? Yeah, it, it, it was completely animated in the month, and then I've just been recompositing the same shots over and over again ever since then and then they keep either getting corrupted or lost or stolen so Ugh. one of these days it'll basically every shot but one in the movie has been completed at some point but they're not sometimes more than once but they're not <laughs> you know they don't all exist at this time so this digital stuff is supposed to make our lives easier, right? It's supposed to make it... Yeah, no. no. No, not even close. So, uh, but anyway, best of luck on your trip. Uh, I'm glad that I get to talk to you before you go to... Um, you, were po you were tweeting something about... You're Ryan Estrada on the Twitters, by the way. And, and uh, you were tweeting something about, like, there's, like, a lot of kidnappings going on in the area you're heading into. That's scary stuff, man. No, I just... I was just listening to an episode of This American Life. And they were, oh, talking, okay. they were talking about it. <laughs> they said that in Colombia there is um, the biggest uh, radio station has a show that's specifically targeted toward people who have been kidnapped. Oh my gosh! And, um, like the families come on and give messages, and and they know that the kidnappers let them listen to that show. Wow. Well, you stay safe when you're on that trip, Ryan. I mean, I'm going to say it again probably a couple times during the show. So um, now I will turn to our other guest, another Michigan cartoonist who is in Michigan, uh, formerly of New York City, uh, Mrs. Janie Ho of chickengirldesign.com. Uh, you did the summer reading game artwork for the Ann Arbor District Library. Yeah, a couple months ago they asked me to do it and yeah, just to design the game card for the kids and the bookmarks and some web badges that you get with their online component. So that was really fun. We're going to talk more about the game later on today. But uh, but yeah, so so actually if you go to AEDL.org, you can actually see some of that artwork right now, right? Yeah, I think so. It's up. 
And I think there's actually a printing workshop coming up in very soon, uh, like a month or two, uh, where your artwork is going to be used in printing some yeah, bags. Yeah, the that's public. That's always fun. Yeah, it's going to be pretty cool. People are going to be printing bags and things with your artwork all over. And, and the stuff is, it looks really awesome. They couldn't have chosen a better artist for it. Oh, uh, thanks. They, they could have chosen me, but I'm glad they chose you. But yeah, I know it looks really awesome. So uh, what else are you known for? I mean, we, you were just at Kids Read Comics and you were selling a whole bunch of things there. Yeah, I was doing, uh, well, I was selling the comic book that I did that was part of the sketchbook project for 2011. If, it's called If You Lived Here. And I just wrote about my experiences um, moving from New York to Ann Arbor. So got a lot of nice feedback from that, you know, both from people who just kind of moved from a big city to a, another smaller town or just people in Michigan. I just got a nice... I just got a nice email from somebody who is a local, local who read my book and was giving me kind of feedback on it. So it was kind of nice. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So that was the, the comic you did for the sketchbook project, yes? Yes. Did you wind up, I remember we talked about this, you were talking about cleaning it up a bit in Photoshop because when you were drawing on those pages double-sided, sometimes the ink would show through in different sizes. Did, did, what did you wind up doing with that? I just cleaned it up. I just Photoshopped like the levels, adjusted the levels, cleaned it up a little bit. I mean, you really encouraged me to really just print a small copy, re regardless of if it was kind of sketchy or not perfect, but it was, it was good. I'm glad I did it. it. It turned out pretty good. I printed through Kablam and they really pulled through. I was at MoCA in April and those books came through and sold some there, so. Oh, very, very cool. And for those who aren't familiar with Janie's work, I would describe it as Charlie Harper meets Richard Scarry. Oh. So it's like the best of both worlds in, in her work. And yes, uh, it, uh, if, what was the title again? It was If You Were Here? If You Lived Here. If You Lived Here is the story. It's an autobio story of you coming from New York City to live in Michigan, but it's you replace you and your husband with chickens and roosters and other there are other animals. There, I don't remember. Well, other people are animals. I mean, you were yeah. a bear. Oh, that's right. I was a bear, <laughs> a bear in the story. Yeah. Yeah, just different animals. That's only because I mean, I mean, the good thing about drawing yourself as an animal, or you know, and other people's animals, is that you kind of can step back from it and not feel like you're spilling your guts out. You know, like a step removed, so you can tell your story and still be honest and be personal, and yet. Like, oh, it's just chicken, so it's okay. It's not really me. <laughs> and, and you just have a fascination with chickens, oh, too. Yes, that too. So <laughs> chicken girl that's design. That's a different story. So. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what, what, what else were you selling at Kids Read Comics that we should make people aware of? I make little things. I, I sold little prints and just my picture books, too. So mm. some postcards. and. You did a couple how to draw books. I did. They're for kids. Yeah. One is called, I think, How to Draw Monsters and Other Scary Things. And the other one is uh, Zoo Animals. So they're just like step by step. They're for young kids, how to draw a giraffe or a lion. And the monsters was fun because I got to make up all the monsters in the book and I got to name all the monsters. So I think that was pretty popular. The kids picked that up. Oh, good, good. Uh, and, and you were tabling at Kids Read Comics next to uh, Dan uh, Danny Jones. Yeah, it was uh, an honor to meet her. Yeah, da uh, dannydraws.com. You guys did a couple of quick draw events together, which like a live <laughs> improvisational yeah. drawing. I didn't get to see them. How did it turn out? <laughs> it was okay. I, I knew going into a comic convention, I should have, uh, you know, brushed up on Darth Vader and Yoda. <laughs> and of course, somebody asked for that, and it was very funny. It was yeah, next time I'm brushing up on all my Star Wars characters. Did the kids give you the brutal honesty of, that's not right? They were nice. They were oh, okay. sweet. They were like, yeah, <laughs> me and Danny somehow winged it, so it was good. It was oh, okay. good. Because I've had that happen. Has this happened to you, Ryan, where a kid comes up to you and asks you for a sketch of something, and then you start drawing it, trying to do it from memory, and, you know, you're winging it, and then it'll be like an eight-year-old kid, and be like, ah, your, the helmet's wrong. <laughs> you did it wrong. You know, did they do that to you? Yeah, I, did a, I did a comic convention in uh, Korea once, and I had never heard of anything they wanted me to draw. <laughs> <laughs> you know. They'd hand me something to draw from. I just have to copy it, and they'd be like, "All right." <laughs> All right. Well, we've, I think we've uh, done a sufficient job of introducing you guys to the public of Ann Arbor. This show is recorded at the Ann Arbor District Library every Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, uh, it's broadcast live at uh, comicsgreat.tv, uh, and you can participate via chat. We've got people in the chat client, and we're going to kick over to our subject, our topic for today. And I'm going to let Ryan introduce this subject, because this is something that we've been talking Was it a year ago now we first broached this topic? At a, mm -hmm. at a bar. Yeah, we were just talking about marketing and I, I, I didn't even notice I had said it. all of a sudden I, I just said 
marketing is just talking to a dude, and all of a sudden you get out your phone and you're twittering it. And I'm like, <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> well, we were talking about. I think I was uh, bemoaning my frustrations with social media etiquette yeah. in house. There are times where people will expect you to uh, retweet their stuff uh, or make an appearance at, at social media things like, oh, well, he didn't retweet me, he didn't tweet about me, he didn't give me a follow Friday, or or he didn't, uh, you know, like my thing on Facebook. Uh, he's he's not being he's not being my friend, you know? And, and it's tough to stay on top of all this stuff. And so I was just bemoaning the fact that sometimes I get a little grief from people when it's just a matter of, I wasn't at the computer that day. I was out and I just didn't see it because the stream comes and it goes in social media, right? And uh, I kind of uh, frustrate out of a sort of like a, what am I trying to say? Uh, a, a declaration of frustration. I said, what are, we, what are we living in? A Jane Austen society where we have to observe all these rules of propriety and go to the proper parties and everything like that? And then that's when Ryan said, no, man, marketing is just talking to dudes. Networking is just talking to dudes. That's what excited me because you were saying something along the line of like uh, what we endorse and what we support matters a lot. And we need to be careful about that, right? And we shouldn't do it for uh, social pressures. I don't know if you could ex expand on that at all. Yeah, like when... You know, Twitter is basically hundreds of people per second telling you to look at something. <laughs> and if you look at every one of those things, then you, there's no way you would ever get anything done. Right. You know, when you tell someone to look at something, if they look at it, you get like 10 seconds for them to, you know, decide if it's worth their time. But to get them to look at it, it needs to be, you know, for me to look at something, it needs to be, first of all, someone whose taste I, I appreciate. Like, it, there's certain people I know that like the same things I do, and, you know, they're, they're not just going to post something because they, you know, something just because of a friend asked them to. Um, and the way they present it, too. It, the, if, if someone posts, um, hey, my, my friend's really trying to get people to read his comic, check it out. There's no way I'm going to click that. <laughs> because, the, you know, it's clear that, um, you're not telling me what I'm going to get out of it. You're telling me what this other guy I've never heard of is going to get out of it. Oh, interesting. But if someone says, this is funny, and I see a bit.ly link that I have no idea what it is, but they said it's funny. I'm going to click it to see what was so funny. Right. Right. This is the value I derive from this, and you might too, right? Instead of saying, like, help out a friend. Yeah. Right. So, okay, no, that's an interesting way of looking at it. I mean, there is sort of an art to posting to social media, isn't there? I would think so. I mean, it's just like you said, just doing something. I, I don't, you know, I, I read my friend's stuff, but I, just because they're my friend doesn't mean I'm going to post something. If I didn't, if I read something and think, wow, I, people would really like that, I'll share it. But, you know, if, if you post anything anyone asks you to, and, you know, if I click the same thing, you know, like I said, if someone says, this is funny, I click on it, I think it's funny, the next time they say, this is funny, I'm going to click on it. And when they promote their own work, I'm going to check it out. But if every time I click on something, I get like, you know, some kind of, you know, cat saying something with inappropriate grammar, <laughs> or something, I'm going to... Hey, maybe I'll like that. <laughs> <laughs> But, but yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, this, this reminds me of something I've talked about before, I probably on this show, and I know others, um, something Tim Street, uh, one Tim Street on the Twitters, he said that uh, social media is a cocktail party, and you don't go to a cocktail party, say, and hand out your business card to a bunch of strangers. That's a, an old joke. I think it was even a Kids in the Hall skit, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but you go to a, to a cocktail party and listen to conversations and hear what people have to say. And if you have something to contribute to that conversation, you contribute. And then if you say something interesting that makes people happy or makes people intrigued, they'll ask for your card. But you don't just go, hey, look at my card, look at my card, look at my card. And that, that is what Twitter becomes after a while, doesn't it? Um, so, Janie, you just did a talk. In, <laughs> it was, was it in Chelsea? Where it was it? in Chelsea. It was in the River Gallery, actually. Oh, funny. Yeah. So tell us about that because this ties into what we're talking about, does it not? Yeah, well, it was on Facebook, we, but it actually kind of bled through to Twitter. Where I talked a little bit about LinkedIn, but I mean, same idea. I was just saying, you know, just share some good stuff. Not Don't always be like, it's not all about you all the time. It's not a look at my work, look at my work, look at my work. So, I mean, give value to other people, too. If you're looking at something interesting you want to share, you know, just, just don't share crap. I don't know. 
Well, that, just yeah. to have something up, you know, just to have. Just, yeah, yeah, the pressure to share just mm-hmm. so that you're staying in the news cycle kind yeah, of idea, yeah. right? Yeah, because like this goes back to something Ryan, I was hinting at that Ryan was talking about. It's like how, Ryan, you're really careful about what you share because what you share is a reflection of you as a person, yeah? Yeah, the, you know, if people can't trust my opinion about other people's work, they're never going to trust my own opinion about my work. <laughs> that's, that's true. That's true, that's very yeah. true. Especially when a lot of people, I notice there's a lot of people who retweet just ev- about everything. And yeah, I guess it is you can't trust what it is that they're, you know, tweeting every 10 seconds sometimes. I don't know. Uh, you know, th- that's, that's where we get into like a, a question about best practices in terms of like frequency and type of content. Can we even, can we even broach that? I mean, that's like totally like uh, going to be singular to each and every person who's using it. Cause there are people who are just use it as a way to be uh, a silly jerk online, just post funny things. And then there's people who use it as a networking tool. There's some people who use it as a self promotion and promoting their friends tool. Everybody's going to use it differently. Right. That's I mean, true. I like a mixture. I usually like, you know, even if it's other artists, I, I kind of do like to get to know them personally, too, not just their artwork, maybe what they're doing, what their hobbies are. So it could be a mixture of things. Do you don't mind it when people post like, oh, I had pancakes for breakfast and a picture of it? No, I mean, sometimes I like people to see, you know, what they like to eat. I don't know. <laughs> I, you know not all the time, but, you know, yeah. it's like, oh, maybe they like to cook. That's their thing. And it's just a way for me to connect with them then. So like, you, you, you know, feel, like feel like a little bit, you're getting to know them a little bit better. Yeah, on a, maybe not just in an art kind of designy world, but just on a, another world too. I mean, I, I like to talk about things that I like. I mean, I, I know I talk about chickens a lot, but there are other little things I like too. And that's also a way for other people who like the same things to connect with me, not just illustration, not just comics, but other subjects. How do you know what's worth sharing though? I mean, I is, is there like a gut reaction you get? Is there like, cause like I've been there when I'm like, oh, I'm so tweeting this. Like when Ryan said that thing, like marketing, just talking to dudes. It's like, that is such a wonderful nugget of wisdom that it needs to be shared with other people. But then I'll be, uh, you know, I'll see something funny. Like uh, I was driving down the freeway on the I-94 and I saw a sign on the right that said left lane closed and a sign on the, uh, right, or on the right that said left lane closed and a sign on the left said right lane closed. And I was like, that's funny. I might share that. And then I didn't, you know, cause I thought eh, it's not that funny, you know? So I, I, I find myself stopping from doing that. I'll get all the way to the last character. I'll go, nah, I'm not going to share that. So I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on how do you know? Any kind well, of, go ahead, Ryan. Uh, for me, the rule, basically not just Twitter, but in anything in life, the, what I want to share with people anytime I have something that I think is worth the time it'll take them to look at it is worthwhile. If I have that 20 times in a day, I'll do it. If I have that once a year, like, um, I have all, I have like 20 page comics that I've done, but I'm not going to release them because I, you know, it takes someone 10 minutes to read this and then at the end they wouldn't get anything out of it. I spent like a week working on it, um, for some customer or something I just did for fun. But I don't want someone to spend 20 minutes of their life and say, well, that was a waste of my 20 minutes. So I'd never show that comic. Yet if I, you know, see a bug do something funny on my windowsill, and I think that that's funny enough for the one second it takes to see it on Twitter, I'll post it. So it's, it's a, um, well, what do they call that? Uh, uh, cost, a cost uh, benefit analysis that you do? <laughs> like, a, like a split second cost benefit analysis of somebody's time? Mm-hmm. Yeah, basically. That, that, that's, that's uncommonly respectful of other people, Ryan. Not, I'm not saying uncommonly for you, but uncommonly for people in general. As, as far as like big projects that I've released and pushed, in like the last five years, I can think of like two or three maybe. Yeah. That like I've really marketed and tried to get people to look at because I, even though I've, in the past few years, I've probably done thousands of pages of work, but... Um, I learned a lesson when I first started working on Cartoon Commune. Um, I wasn't having time to do my own stuff, so I would just post everything I did in Cartoon Commune, like, hey, here's a 24-page comic about someone's boyfriend is a superhero fighting a shark. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that all of my readers disappeared. Oh. And uh, because there's so many times they'd spend all this time reading a 20, 30-page comic from me, and you got nothing out of it because it's made solely for the audience of this one girl's boyfriend. So, okay, I'm going to step back a little bit based on what you said. That's an interesting statement because that almost suggests that frequency is not as important as consistency of quality in this case. 
Does that sound fair or am I over, over, am I over generalizing? That's definitely what I'd say. I mean, it, some people, um, the frequency is important for, for certain types of work. Like if you're doing a comic strip, if you can, you know, the, like a lot of the web, web comics, the way they work is if they can hit a target five days a week, they get people coming back. But it's important that they keep that um, level of quality. Like if, if you have a terrible comic and you just say, oh, I have to post a comic today and post it, that's going to be someone's first time looking at your site. Remember mm -hmm. I said that, um, you know, when someone clicks on something on Twitter, you have about 10 seconds to get them hooked. And mm -hmm. if they go to your, your site and you have some ugly filler, that was your chance. All that marketing you've done, all the marketing you've thought about, that was wasted because the 10 seconds you had to get them as a reader is gone. But what about, I mean, what about the, the fascination nowadays with people being interested in process, uh, behind the scenes work, uh, seeing something come together? Because I know some cartoonists, they'll post their page in progress throughout the week. Oh, here's the pencils. Two days later, inks are done. Three days later, the colors are done. I mean, you're not seeing the final polished work in that case. I mean, isn't there a case to be made for letting even the, the dirty, ugly stuff hang out sometimes because it lets people into it? Like a, going back to something Janie said about letting people see more into the life of the cartoonist. Or is this like a specific case I'm speaking of? Yeah, well, I mean, I love looking at that stuff. I'm, that stuff isn't not worth looking at. Yeah. Like I, I love seeing people's pencils, and that's worth my time. Um, I wouldn't post my pencils because my pencils don't mean anything. Like my, when I sketch, it's like it would not make sense to anyone. It's like this <laughs> visual shorthand that only makes sense to me, and it's not until I do inks that it looks like anything. Okay. Um, I wouldn't post that. I mean, there are I do a lot of times post stuff in progress when I think this this is interesting the way I did it. Um, you know, like I said, it's just looking at this and is it worth someone's time? Yeah. But th that's, that's got to be something that requires a lot of careful self-reflection, I would imagine, to be able to determine that. And you're probably not always going to be right about it every time. Yeah, like I said, that's why, I, that's why I'm so adamant about it now, because I did such a terrible job of it for so long. <laughs> <laughs> so going back to the original question, Janie, and now that, we've, that Ryan and I kind of dug into like a certain channel of this thing, how do, you, do you have any like, uh, reflections on your thought process on whether you, how you know whether or not something's worth sharing? Because you will share things like, here's something I did. You'll share something like, here's something that I think is cool. But then you'll also sometimes go on record to say, uh, just po point out a pet peeve about your industry or about people or, you know, <laughs> you, 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 you let us into your worldview too. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm a pretty private person in general. I think when I had my blog, when I first started blogging, I was sharing a lot of things, a lot of like, you know, my hobbies, a lot of more personal stuff. But then once Facebook came around and Twitter came around and I thought I was just sharing, you know, I kind of wanted my privacy back a little bit. I mean, so I think that's just me being a private person has kind of in all this social media, I feel like, you know, people can Google my name and they can know so much stuff. Like people can get my bio just by Googling me without even asking me or, you know, emailing me asking about my information. So I think I've been kind of reserved in that. So I know that when to stop yeah. in, you know, what to share and what not to share. But I also am doing, you know, this is my life. This is full time. I do this full time every day I draw. So it's also very natural, I guess. I don't yeah. know. Things I think about, I mean, half the time it's about art or design or what I'm going to do next. That's or... true. That's true. You don't, you guys, neither of you have to th like stop and go, what did I think about today? Right. Cause yeah. you guys are always up to your necks in art. Right. It's, so it's all the time. So yeah. Yeah. yeah I bet yeah. that makes a difference. It makes it easier for you to edit. Because like, it's like going back to the idea of like film, right? It's like you shoot like five times more film than you need and then you edit down to what is absolutely like the communicative parts and like that's your lives now. But I mean, going back to your talk on, on Facebook, Janie, um, what were some of the best practices that you pointed out during that discussion? Do you remember? I think it was just sharing information. I mean, not, you know, if you found some a cool site that you know that, you know, you should share with other people. I just don't think it's just all about me, 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 you know, I think it's boring. I don't want to see somebody's feed always just like, this is my art, this is my sketch, this is, you know, I think you have to think about 
like what you're saying would benefit other people too. I mean, I, I have a lot of like contacts on Facebook and Twitter that's just fellow illustrators. It's nice to just talk shop. I'm alone in my studio a lot. So that was one of the things we talked about was just, you know, and all the, also other artists just saying, I don't have enough time to be on Facebook and Twitter, but. That's right. You, you participate. I don't know if you've done this, Ryan. I imagine you probably have, or at least are familiar with it. The Kid Lit Chat uh, hashtag yeah, that you guys yeah. do. How often do you do that? It's Thursdays at nine. Shout out to that. <laughs> if anybody wants to uh, come to that. It's, so what yeah. is it? Explain what it is. Kid Lit Art. It's the hashtag. It's um, oh, okay. yeah, just a bunch of children's book illustrators and just talking shop. There's a topic every every Thursday and. And it's just fun. We just talk about webs we can website promotion, how to get submit to publishers. Mm -hmm. It's everything. So that's a great resource to start. So just go to twitter.com and search for hashtag, hashtag kidlit kid art, art, and you can mm -hmm. watch the conversation unfold, right? Yeah. So okay. So Renee Van Belton posted in the chat, and I think this is interesting. He he's, when Ryan and I were talking, he said, "So are you suggesting that social media is a public performance?" And I think that that's that's getting there. But what you were talking about, Janie, was about being helpful and useful to other people too, right? Well, I know that Danny draws, Danny Jones, you know, talk about being helpful. And I think that's, that's great. I, I, I like getting information of what other people are doing, you know, yeah. helpful things. Even Why would I keep it to myself sometimes if I like a, you know, because okay. it's your trade secret, because then somebody could yeah. do what you do, and then they could be a competitor. But I'm, a, <laughs> I'm a really big believer that, you know, I don't know, sharing your secrets, it just makes you be a little bit better. I mean, I know that what I do, I don't think it's there's no secret sauce to it. I, I, <laughs> I do it in Illustrator, and there are tons of people um, doing their artwork in Illustrator. So, you know, what do I do? You know, I just have to be better. If I find a cool color site that I, I go to, I'm going to share with other people. It's not, I don't know, it's not a big secret that I have this secret color palette that nobody can use or. I don't know. I've told this story before, but it, it's worth repeating. When I was in high school, I dated a girl whose dad was uh, a professor of literature uh, at, at a college, and he was he was a big big poetry nerd, like old poetry. He was super like like the way I feel about comics. This guy felt about poetry, and he had a friend who, in the middle of the night, in the middle of a rainstorm, jumped on his bike and rode to his house to show him this rare poem that he found, you know? Because that's how excited he was about it. He had to show him, even though it's like two o'clock in the morning, and even though it's raining, I gotta show this to you right now. And I thought, man, that's what the artist's life should be like. You should be surrounded by people who are like that, who wanna share stuff with you with that kind of level of enthusiasm, you know? And that kind of raises your sort of, um, the, the public's perception of you, right? Because they think like, wow, this guy is, I feel good about every time he or she says something. Therefore, when Janie Ho says, hey, I got a book out, and it's not that's not why you do it, right? You don't do it in order to get no, that book sale. Because it's it. just constantly in my life, all these little things, information that I get. You know, yeah. so why not? I know other people would like that, so why not share it with other people? <laughs> so what were you gonna say, Ryan? I saw you leaning forward, like oh, I got it. I got it. <laughs> yeah, I, I had, I when I heard that, I really wanted to clarify what I was saying. It, I made it sound like I, I do this every time I post something. I'm in this panic t attack about. <laughs> worth someone's time but <laughs> it goes back to marketing is talking to a dude like it I think like I just if my if I had a roommate and they were sitting on the at the other table would I call them over and be like hey look at this or would I tell them this yeah I just communicate with people how I would if they were sitting in the room and uh, then I don't waste their time because I wouldn't I wouldn't do that to my roommate. I wouldn't say, hey, look at this thing that my friend made. I don't really like it, but I feel obligated to tell you about it. Right, right. It, it just, uh, it, it's a simple, uh, simple way of putting it is, is whenever you say, isn't this neat, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's how it is for me, is I try to think about, is this something where I would say, isn't this neat? Uh, and, and yeah, it's un unfortunately, like anything, like anything when social um, society gets involved, there's always going to be a party that comes in and says, Hey, it'd be a big help to me if you would uh, mention the thing that I did because uh, if I get mentioned to your constituency, then they're just going to magically give me money. Is that, does that ever work for you guys? <laughs> oh, gosh, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, where you solicited somebody? I don't. Know, I'm not saying that you did, but I'm just saying, like, can you see that work? Yeah. Because I've I've had people give me a, a a little shout out because I made them happy or something, and then like, oh, I got a little social media bump because so and so who has a big audience said that I'm a nice guy. 
but never I don't I don't recall ever going up to somebody who you know and leaving my book on their table a famous person and then or getting their picture with my book or something like that having any effect on my sales or status or any of that kind of stuff. Well, I it know. Just, no, go, go ahead, ahead. go ahead, yeah, Ryan. Yeah, it basically just makes you look desperate and uh, kind of annoys them. It's that whenever you're actively trying to market something, it people don't like to be marketed to. It affect, it triggers that thing, same thing in their mind as when a salesman comes up to the, their door or they get a tele, you know, telemarketer calling them. It's just they, it, you immediately shut, shut down. It's like um, I was thinking today about how you and I met, Jersey. We were, um, you were at a, what was the, the show you were at? The, um, in Detroit, it was like a. Oh, oh, was it was it the um, Detroit Urban Craft Fair? Yeah. Was it that? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. That is where we met, and I didn't know who the heck you were until you said your name. Yeah, we. Uh, I just kind of came by, and I, I recognized some of your stuff. Um, I recognized your style, and I just asked where I recognized it from. We realized that we both worked um, on Modern Tale sites. We both worked in Graphic Smash, and we just chatted about you know, being back in Michigan and what's going on in Michigan, neither one of us, I don't think, mentioned our work at all. I mean, yours was sitting out, you're at a show, but, right. you know, we, you know I, I picked it up, I flipped through it, and then um, I left and we talked more after that. And, you know, if either one of us had, you know, so at so many conventions, you get that one guy who's like, hey, 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 come here, come here, let me, let me, let me up. Yeah. And, you're like, you run away. If you don't run away, then you stand there and bear it. Yeah. And like this, Grit your teeth and let him finish his spiel, and then run away. <laughs> yep. <laughs> or, get to work or speak to him again. Um, there was a show in uh, Michigan that I did. Uh, it was a little comic convention. It took place in this long hallway, and uh, it was kind of like there were two doors, and then the, you know, the, in between the doors was the middle, and then there was two ends. I was on the end, and the door was here, and then right before the door was this one guy who was just like every time he opened his mouth you could see every other cartoonist go like this <laughs> because he was screaming like he wouldn't let people go at one point he ran out and grabbed someone and pulled them back in wow say yes. like he'd be like look we should read this comic they're like uh, no that's okay and he, like even me I tried to have a real conversation with him and I could tell he wasn't listening. He was waiting for his opportunity to, um, like I mentioned, I was flying somewhere the next day. I'd just been talking about how I felt bad I couldn't buy comics because I moved every few months. And you know, I was packing my life into a backpack and in two days, and I was leaving. And as soon as I stopped talking, he went into a spiel. The same oh spiel my God. all day. And I'm like, I, I literally just closed my mouth from saying I, I can't pack these books and what happened was as soon as people passed him they got scared and ran out the door and no one came to our side of the room yeah. and the whole day we were empty yet the other thing about that day was that while he was so pushy my technique was I didn't have anything to push at that point because um, like I said I haven't finished a major project that I want to push I've been working on commissions and stuff that's making me money but I don't need to marketed. Um, so I was just there saying hi to people, telling them about my site. If anyone asked if I had any books for sale, I'd say, eh, I do technically, but they're all on my site for free, so just go there. And uh, that was how I sold. The whole day he sold, uh, I think, one three-pack of books. Um, a, he made a single sale, and I made like $150 in sales. <laughs> site and bought all my books that wow. I didn't have for sale there. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, I, the same thing happened to me at Heroes Con in 2006. I, I was right around the corner from a guy who was literally standing in the aisle. He did, he got out from behind his table and was waving his arms, and he had a he had a suit on too, which just made it even more. It felt even more sleazy at a comic con for a guy to be wearing like a, a big fancy suit. You know, it just needed to be made out of gold lame or something. That was the only way he could push it any further. But he was like waving the comic in the air, like first edition, gonna be worth a million dollars. What do I gotta do to get you into this comic kind of thing? And then what, by the time people got to me, me, they just looked beleaguered. <laughs> and that's all that does. And what's funny, those guys, their technique is always, if you say no, they'll say, I'll give you a free poster. <laughs> it's, it's, he I did have free posters. posters. Look at it. Why would I hang a picture of it on my wall? 
<laughs> That's about right. <laughs> use a little logic, dude. All right. Okay. So um, I want to use uh, somebody posted in the chat. I think it was uh, Renee Van Beltzen again. He said, uh, someone who uses Twitter to its fullest, Krishna Sanasavam of PCWeenies.com. And he's going to be on next week, as a matter of fact. And uh, so I thought that, that that's a great segue to talk about who are some people we can point to who do it right. Some some uh, case studies worth looking at. Uh, any yeah, well, I'm, Krishna is a very good point. I'm just thinking about it. I'm looking at my desktop right now, and all of my icons were taken from a post that he just made. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can't. There's there's like ten things in a row that like he posted something, and then I was either posting it myself or installing it in my computer or reading it, learning about it. Yeah, Krishna is always posting resources to things or uh, sales on things that we would want to use, like, you know, the Wacom tablets or Wacom tablets or whatever, you know, uh, or articles that are worth reading, tutorials that are worth looking at, and then he intersperses it with, oh, I did a PC Weenies thing. But, yeah, he's PC Weenies on the Twitters, I think, yeah. So... Um, I'm trying to think of who else because I'm I, I I can vamp all well Chris Janie thinks well I don't know I'm well, out right I, now. Well, I know Janie no. you would recommend uh, Danny Jones oh she's great yeah and I'm glad I got a chance to meet her this past weekend she's always really good and it's it's funny because she kind of um adds a little um she's she can be very honest too about certain things which, yes she can yeah which I love because <laughs> I know a lot of us is like oh, I don't want to say that but we all we're all thinking it so. I don't know, a nice dose of honesty is always good about the industry, just about what's going on. So, yeah. yeah. And, and some, yeah, sometimes she can say things that could potentially make some people irritated. And then uh, I noticed that, at least from what I see on my feed, that Dan Danny doesn't spend an inordinate amount of time defending her points. She just says it and moves on. Um, I, I would recommend actually Ryan is a great guy to follow because Ryan is the kind of guy who will just post funny things and then you can get into a funny discussion. We got into a midnight discussion about what was it, Mad Men we were talking about? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you were just saying something about it. I watched it, didn't quite get it, and then I wrote I, I at, at mentioned you and I said that yeah, I found it dreary and uh incomprehensible. And then you said, uh, good thing we're talking about this at midnight <laughs> because we would be tarred and feathered. Now we're gonna be tarred and feathered because I brought it to the show of the day. Yeah. Right in the middle of the afternoon. Oh, God. <laughs> I just finished the seasons of Mad Men on Netflix. I liked it. A lot of people like it. And, and like it, it. But, but that's what's funny is about it, sharing your opinion online is that everybody, oh, Ryan, you had a great way of phrasing this. Oh, I don't remember exactly how it went. But I was talking about how whenever I express my opinion on anything, it's like 20 people line up to say, hey. And then you said to me, uh, I think it was something along the lines of people feel the need to defend their choices in life, you know, for better word. We all do. And so when you say you don't like something, that can be construed by some as an attack on who they are, right? Yeah. So um, any, other, any other people who, who post good information? I should be looking at my Twitter oh, no, feed. I should look at my Twitter feed, too. Everybody look at their Twitter feed. <laughs> <laughs> blanking now there's just so many good people i know and this is totally like <laughs> asking, <now> I'm, <laughs> it, it's like <laughs> asking people like for shout outs during an interview and you're like oh i'm oh. gonna forget somebody and they're gonna be like rawr, 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 rawr. well the thing of twitter is that it's just so quick that everybody's got a short attention span it's 10 seconds again it's yeah really is nobody has any more time for anything <laughs> How, I mean, what do you guys feel about people who kind of retweet the same thing like the same thing over and over because I tend to usually just tweet like one thing if I'm talking about you know a book I have coming out something that's released oh or this is post. I'll tell you one that I did that uh I, I got the vibe that people were irritated with me for doing it um I, and, and I, I don't know if this is hubris or what, but I was I, I posted something, and I don't remember what it was, but it was something of asking the opinions of the crowd. Okay, what do you guys think of this, right? Mm -hmm. And people started responding. And so I started retweeting their responses with like a sentence from me sort of exp like uh, responding to the response just to show that the conversation was happening. You know, like how like the kid lit art chat, right? But instead it was like it just I was facilitating a conversation on Twitter amongst me and my followers. And when somebody who I was following said some or who followed me rather, said something, a response that I thought was really interesting, I shared that. And I got the feeling that some people got irritated with me from all the retweets of other people's stuff that I was like trying to get, because I like thinking of it as a conversation tool, right? But uh, not everybody wants to be party to my conversation, and to which I would say, well, then don't follow me. Or uh, am, am I damaging my marketing by 
using my marketing channel as a conversation tool, right? I don't know. What do you guys think? I think that your marketing is about getting the people who like what you do to find your stuff, not about adapting what you do to fit this hypothetical audience. Yeah. If you like conversations, then people who like reading those conversations are going to read your stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I like to follow what my the people I'm following, what conversations they're having. So if you're just replying to somebody, I don't, I don't know what's going on. So I, I like the retweeting of what was the you know original conversation starter? Was what, what was the original question? I yeah. like seeing that. But yeah, I, I do too. I I get kind of see what's the reason I started doing it was because it's frustrating for me when I see somebody just responding to other mm -hmm. people without seeing what the, the, the source material was. I guess in that's in that case you'd always use a hashtag. But but in, in, again, I, I I like Ryan's sort of outlook on this is that being natural. You know, operating on a sense of being natural is the only way to really get the audience that you want. But that requires a sort of kind of like relaxation and comfort with yourself, I would imagine. I mean, yeah. Twitter is, I mean, it's basically everyone can see your tweets, really. So what are you going to do? People are going to like, you know, there's going to be people who like it and don't like it. So 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 uh twitter is a way to go through the high school drama movie sort of arc of your character in public you start out being all concerned about it you start out worrying about doing it right and eventually you find out who you are and what, what you're here for and then you just start doing it naturally now you're popular <laughs> did i just make it sound grim and horrible <laughs> maybe i did okay well, i just feel like the second the second you're actively marketing yourself or marketing your work, you're not doing it right. And the second people know that, feel like you're marketing to them, you've lost them forever. That's, like I said, it gets that, that thing in your brain. There's a, um, when I was in India, my job was training uh, call center workers and dealing with Americans. And I did this training session on how to be a sales ninja. Oh, yeah, I want to hear about this. They had to... Um, Basically, I was working at uh, City Mortgage, and they were just taking payments and stuff. And suddenly, the, the Citibank started telling them, at the end of every call, you have to try and sell the customer a product. And this came out of nowhere. They didn't, they'd never done this before. And they started saying, if you don't sell X number of products, then you don't get your bonus for this month. Um, and I, th this had nothing to do with my job, but I put together a training just because I could tell they all hated it so much and they were dreading it. So basically I said, what we're going to talk about is the difference between being a sales ninja and a sales samurai. When a samurai attacks you, the samurai is going to pick up a big sword and scream and run straight at you. <laughs> and you're going to see him coming and you're going to get ready to fight. He's probably still going to beat you, but you can at least get ready. When a ninja attacks you, you have no idea the ninja attacked you. You're just dead. Oh, yeah. So what I said is don't let the customer know that you're selling to them. Don't finish, say, is there anything else I can assist you with? Well, while I have you on the line, let me tell you about this wonderful product the customer's hung up. Yep. What I said is if the customer um, is complaining about how they forgot to pay their bill this month, be like, well, you know, there's a reminder service, right? Yeah, yeah. And then... The customer has no idea you're selling it to them. If they say, yeah, I don't want that, then you can mention another product later. They have no idea that you ever mentioned it. And I, uh, they started doing this, and all of a sudden their sales started shooting up, and no one was bothered by it again. And then like two days later, Citibank uh, called and said, why are you all going off script? You have to stay on script. <laughs> and then it went back down. Boo. Oh, oh man. Uh, but okay, well, what about okay? I'm gonna play devil's advocate just for a second, Ryan. Um, what what about the person who says, "Well, then you're being extra deceitful because you're tricking people into a sense of complacency and you're uh, tricking them into spending money on your stuff." Um, well, the tricks that I was telling them was tell the customers about the things that they could actually use. Uh -huh. Don't don't tell them, you know, don't trick someone into buying. Yeah, you know, I forget. I can't even remember all the stupid products they were offering because they were so ridiculous. But I said, don't just say something that has nothing to do with the customer. If the customer mentions a problem or is complaining about something, mention it. Um, just like I, 
the only time I've ever really been in sales myself was I was working at my mother's, uh, my mother was running a portrait studio and I was helping her out at Christmas and I actually had to sell because it affected my mother's bonuses and stuff. So um, I would have a lot of customers come in that there was this weird thing at the, there where, um, you know, you go to portrait studio, get the, the coupon for the package and it's five ninety nine. You get all these pictures, but people would come in with thirty kids and take different pictures of all the kids. And uh, it, you know, you can only use that for one picture. So they'd after that that package, they'd end up spending twenty dollars for each picture, and it'd come out like a thousand dollars more. Mm. And I knew it was in their best interest to throw away that coupon and not use it. But they wouldn't believe me. They'd think I was trying to cheat them. But I had this technique called the look over your shoulder technique. Anytime I tell the customer that, I just go, and then tell them. <laughs> and I said, really? And took it. So they didn't even notice that I did it, but psychologically what it did is it put me on their side. I'm making sure my boss isn't looking. I'm making sure the other customers aren't looking to know that I'm giving them a, telling them the way to save money. Because I knew eventually we were going to get to it anyway, but I was just going to have to argue with them for half an hour but the second I did that they knew I was on their side and they did what I told them to do and then they trusted me enough they knew I wasn't going to cheat them that they ended up spending a lot more than they would have because they don't feel like they're battling against me to save money wow mm. wow impressive that that is pretty yeah. clever and and it, it it sort of illustrates this whole idea of it's about building trust with a constituency right and mm -hmm. and being and the only way to really build trust is to be you have to have a sense of respect for your audience and their time otherwise because mm -hmm. one thing that social media has really done and I, I think this is true i haven't done any studies on this but i bet i bet the other people would back me up on this is that it really kind of uh it exposes your full personality to the internet whether you know it or not Right, uh, because there's going to be a time where you let your guard down. There's going to be a time where you're a little sleepy, or you had a little uh, something to drink, and you post something that reveals something about you that even you aren't aware is what it's. And, and you could probably collect somebody's feed and do a, a psychological profile on a person very easily. Uh, so if if you are a little bit passive aggressive, or if you have some anger issues, or if you if you have some uh, misogyny <laughs> in your psychological makeup, all that stuff's going to come out eventually. So it does. Doesn't, all these techniques that Ryan's talking about, I suspect it doesn't alleviate you from being a good person, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like we're, we know we're all there, too. You know, we all want to part of it market ourselves. I mean, at some point, we're, we're going to market ourselves, whether we're saying we are or not, aren't. But Do you, So you don't buy the, the, the argument from some people where I just share stuff online, but I don't care if anybody reads it. Of course, everybody cares. <laughs> not everybody cares about it. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I'm there to have fun, too. I mean, I'm well, there sure. to have fun, really, genuinely want to meet people. I mean, I'm in my studio all day. I don't yeah. get out. Twitter, Facebook, that's like, these are my, you know, my colleagues, the, the guy next to the cubicle. So No, th this show is a perfect example of that kind of, of thinking, is that, uh, yes, this is designed to be useful and helpful to people, entertaining to people to whatever degree that it is. Uh, but for me personally, and I said this right from the start when I did episode one, this is my social hour. This is the way I get to get out and yeah. talk with other cartoonists about things I care about, you know? So it's 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 nice that it does double duty and becomes a show that helps promote all the stuff that we do, but it's mostly for me at, at any rate. This is like, these are the conversations I wish I could have in the studio, right? So. Yeah. Okay, well, we're coming up toward... Oh, go ahead, Ryan. Go ahead. The reason we talk about these things isn't because we're marketing ourselves. It's because we're nerds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about this all day long. <laughs> that's exactly right, yeah. Okay, well, we're coming up towards the end here, and I wanted to break into the news segment, which eventually I'll get a stinger for that I can play on the show. Or not news, but um, uh, calendar events. But before we do that, I want to give some shout-outs to people. Uh, if you want to follow some very interesting people on Twitter, you can follow Jan uh, Janny Ho, J-A-N-N-I-E-H-O, and uh, chickengirldesign.com. Yep. What, you, are you on Tumblr, too? Nope, I'm not on Tumblr. Not yet? Oh, <laughs> Danny Jones is on Tumblr. I think you better do it. I have too many things. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Just add another one. But. DeviantArt, are you on there? Nope. No. No? Uh, the only place to go is chickengirldesign.com then. And chickengirldesign.blogspot.com is uh, my blog. So. There we go. Uh, and on Facebook? Do you have a Facebook page? I'm on Facebook. Slash, yeah, Facebook slash Janie Ho. 
Oh, That's simple it. enough. Yep. Clear branding. Uh, Ryan Estrada. Ryan Estrada is about to head out into the, the wild world of South America. And uh, you can find him at ryanestrada.com, cartooncommune.com if you want to pay him to draw a comic for you. Um, Ryan Estrada on the Twitters, right? Yeah. Anything else that you want to, like, that you think is neat that people could look at? If they think, uh, if, 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 they, if they thought what you said today was cool and interesting and they want to find out more about this Ryan Estrada guy, where should they go? When you go to the front page of ryanestrada.com, all the work I'm proud of is right there. And uh, I'm going to be posting a lot of um, lot more stuff coming soon that I don't want to start pushing heavily yet because it's not done and I don't want you to get sick of hearing about it before it is. But they can, they can subscribe to the RSS feed and then be notified when yeah. something worthwhile is happening. Oh, yeah. you're, Janie, you're on the Instagrams too, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So you can go on Instagram and look for Janie Ho. Ryan, are you? Do you, do you have any place where you post photos of all your exploits? Just the no, blog? Twitter. Okay, just Twitter. Oh, that's right. Yeah, twit pick and things like that. Okay. Well, guys, this was an awesome discussion. I feel really good about it, and I hope I can get you guys back for another one of these. That was super fun. So I'm going to kick over to the calendar because there's stuff going on in Ann Arbor that's worth looking at. Uh, until the end of the month, you can go to Chelsea, uh, Michigan. Go to the Chelsea River Gallery. That's ChelseaRiverGallery.com. You can check out the exhibition that Janie's in. Yay. The Comic Jam. It's open until the end of the month. You can purchase art there, uh, fine art by uh, Michigan cartoonists and beyond. Uh, we'll have to get Ryan in the next one, actually. If you are, are you coming back to Michigan uh, anytime um, I soon? I have no idea what happens after South America. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming back. <laughs> I'm going to watch your Twitter feed like a hawk to make sure nothing happens to you. Um, but I hope you can come back towards the end of the year. It'd be cool to do another one of these uh, art shows with you in it, too. Uh, so the, anyway, ChelseaRiverGallery.com. They're open Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Thursday from 11 to 8.30 p.m. And Saturday, 11 to 8 p.m. June 23rd, that's this week. I think it's this Thursday. The Teen Graphic Novel Academy starts at the Ann Arbor uh, Art Center. That's annarborartcenter.org. That's where you can sign up. That's at 117 West Liberty Street. I'll be teaching a eight-week course on graphic novels for teens. So if you have a teen in your life that you think needs a little bit more instruction, you can send them my way there. Uh, June 30th, uh, I think that's when it ends, Green Brain Comics in Dearborn is assembling an exhibit for the Headspace Gallery in honor of the 50th anniversary of the first issue of the Fantastic Four that appeared in November 1961. And they're doing a call out for artists to draw a page of the story in their style to be put in a gallery exhibition. So it'll be, the gallery exhibition will be the full issue in order, but each page will be interpreted by a different artist. So that's pretty cool. Uh, I wish I had time to participate in that. Uh, the sign-up form is at greenbrain.biz slash gallery.htm, gallery with a capital G. And then um, got the summer reading game coming up at AADL with Jeannie's art all over it. And for that, I was wondering if we could get Eli Nyberger in here. I think he's outside of the studio right now. Um, he's going to take your spot for a second, Janie. Okay. Oh, I see a thumbs up from Eli. He's coming in. Okay. So we'll just ask you to switch spots for a second so Eli could talk about this with all us. Right. And then we could say our goodbyes. But um, also, uh, while Eli comes in here, July 5th, coming up, uh, Graphic Novel or Comic Book Academy at Mallet's Creek. You can find information about that at AADL.org. Free six-week class at the Ann Arbor District Library. I think, yeah, Mallet's Creek from 1 to 3 p.m. Tuesdays. And then Wednesdays, starting July 6th from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at the Pittsfield Branch, I'm going to be doing uh, Comics Fundamentals, an adult comics class. Uh, don't read into that. It just means it's a comics class for grown-ups. So, Eli. Hey, hey, Jersey. Thanks for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So, we got some cool stuff going on with the summer reading game. That's for sure. Yeah. What's, tell me about this. Well, you know, summer reading is, a, is a very much a staple of library programming all across the U.S. It's not really heard of outside the U.S. It's a very kind of American public library thing. But, uh, you know, it's, it was born out of a desire to kind of keep kids' reading skills up over the summer. Uh, but now that kids are uh, pretty much soaking in text all day long, no matter what they're interested in, it's not so much about it, that exactly anymore. So we wanted to really have an opportunity to kind of encourage people to really use the library and take advantage of all the different resources that we have here. So uh, we wanted to also have a game that was fun to play as opposed to just kind of like a, I write down a list of things and then I get a prize at the end. So uh, we basically kind of took a, a model that's uh, four square plus scavenger if you've ever played the scavenger texting game uh, and it's basically when you sign up for the game and you just go to play.adl.org to sign up for it uh, you can then start earning points for all the things you do at the library including tagging items in the catalog uh, rating items in the catalog writing reviews we have 
a, just an unprecedented increase in the amount of ratings and reviews and tags that we've gotten cool. just since the game launched not even a week ago. So it's just crazy that this is, I mean, I shouldn't be surprised that when you give people points for things that they start doing it more, but uh, <laughs> wow, it's really working. And of course, with that comes some unintended consequences, but we will work that out as we nerf as appropriate <laughs> as, uh, as things get used. So um, the basic, the gameplay is you use your library and then you get stuff, you earn points. And then on July 5th, we'll be opening up a store at play.aedl.org where players of the game can trade in their points for excellent library stuff mugs and all that kind of stuff. Do you have to be a card holder at AEDL in you order have to, to be a You don't have to be a card holder to play the game. You do have to be a card holder to receive prizes I because see. you have to come pick them up in person because this is a game for our patrons. Right. And anyone's welcome to play and earn points just for fun and anyone can have an account on AEDL.org. But the prizes are provided by the friends of the library, a very generous support that we get from them every year. And uh, so they're intended for Ann Arbor District Library patrons. So okay. if you've got a library card, you can get a prize. If you don't have a library card, then you can still play for fun get all kinds of stuff, earn badges. Uh, we have a number of different badges that are out there, and there'll be more badges every week. And actually, we have a code for listening to this podcast. Oh, my gosh. And the, uh, <laughs> the, the code is CAGROX, C-A-G ROCKS. And, uh, R-O-C-K-S. R-O-C-K-S, yes. Yeah. C-A-G-R-O-C-K-S is the code. And if you enter that at play.aadl.org right now or text it to the short code 4AADL, number 4AADL, if you text the phrase CAG ROCKS, Right now, you'll get, I think, put 300 points in there. Oh, just awesome. That. So and uh, so it pays connect. to watch comics are great when it's live. Absolutely. <laughs> you never know what you might find out, and you're getting a look behind the, the creative process. So. <laughs> awesome. So, um, uh, so actually, this is something that we can also crowdsource comics are great listeners to do, to, is to participate in this game. Even if they can't get prizes, they could go and go to the uh, graphic novel collection and post reviews and ratings oh, right yeah. now to let the public, of uh, let the Ann Arbor public, realize what comics are worth reading. Definitely, and especially when it comes to real standout graphic novels, uh, there's a lot of things that could, could use tags like Eisner Award winners. There's oh, great yeah. things to tag. There's all kinds of stuff that if you tag them with something about them or, you know, uh, Let's, let's see. The traditional library cataloging processes don't have like shoujo and by shonen and that kind oh, of yeah. stuff as tags, but that's really useful information to have when you're considering checking out a piece of manga. So having those sorts of information in the catalog is a really great way. And this is just a, something to incentivize people to help us get that information better. Oh, awesome. Okay, so play.aedl.org. Play Everybody actually, go to it. Yeah, go and actually all the graphic design for it as well as uh, our kids' game was designed by the wonderful and talented Janie Ho, who was ah. just your guest here. And uh, she did a really great job on all that stuff for us, and it just it just looks so great. So yeah, it does. For that. Oh, gosh, yeah, for sure. Oh, we lost Ryan, so... Uh, uh, I, marketed him, I marketed him away. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay, because we were going to close out anyway, so I want to thank Ryan Estrada of ryanestrada.com, Ryan Estrada strata on twitter janie ho of chickengirldesign.com and janie ho on twitter and eli nyberger of aadl.org thanks everybody for the spending time with us in the chat and for hanging out with us and listening until next time i've been jersey drozd of comicsaregreat.com and jersey on the twitters okay bye